So these will be some algebraic, well, these are more than just algebraic properties. They're just properties of similar matrices. So in this, A is going to be similar to B. So A and B will be the similar matrices. All right, so first of all, determinant of A is determinant of B. So that is one property they have. Second property. So just looking at property A, what if I told you A is invertible? What would that mean about A's determinant? Not zero. So property, the above property says, well, it has to equal B's determinant. So B's determinant would not be zero, meaning B is invertible. So A is invertible if and only if B is invertible. So next property, the ranks are equal. And remember the rank counts the number of, one way to think about it, the number of columns that are not free. Uh, what was the other property of a matrix that was sort of the complement to the rank? The, null. the nullality. So the null the nullality is the rank of the null space, or the dimension of the null space, and nullality is just that dimension. So if your rank is the same, that means your null, nullality would also be the same. It'd be like basically your dimension minus your rank would be that. So next property, A and B have the same characteristic polynomial. Remember, the characteristic polynomial is the polynomial you get when you do a minus lambda i uh, determinant equals zero. That's the polynomial you get out of that guy. And it'll be, I think I use p of lambda for that. So that's our characteristic polynomial. What that means is you get the same thing from a minus lambda i or b minus lambda i. And of course, that means A and B have the same eigenvalues. So let's I think the first one's probably a good one to prove. If we can prove the first one, we get the second one immediately. So let's go and prove the first one. So we're going to start with the supposition that A is similar to B. And if we keep writing super math notation, so this if and only if double arrow means uh, this is true exactly when what I write over here is true. So I'm going to write the definition P inverse A P equals B. So that's what it means to be similar. You get this matrix P such that multiplying like this makes A turn into B. And so I want to look at uh, determinant. Let's look at determinant of B. So right, let's just take the determinant of this P inverse AP. So if two matrices are equal, then their determinants are equal. That's pretty clear. So we have that product equals B. So the determinant of that product matrix is determinant of B. Now what I'm going to do is split up the determinant across that product. 
So we saw that you can, this is true for multiplication, that the determinant splits across the product right here. So now what we're looking at on the left side is a product of three numbers. No longer looking at matrix multiplication. So what I'm allowed to do is commute. So let's go ahead and commute. So I just moved the determinant of P next to determinant of P inverse. Uh, so here, there's a few things I could do, a few ways I could deal with this. One of them is determinant of P inverse is one over determinant of P. That's one of the properties you can use. So it would look like that right there. And of course, P divided, determinant of P divided by determinant of P would be one. It would cancel out. And so we just left with determinant of A. And on the right side, at the very top, we had determinant of B. So we just proved it that way. There's another way you could go instead. I'll just shift gears with this purple marker here. So the property I just used is I uh, multiplying outside determinants the same as multiplying inside determinants. And what is P inverse times P? That's identity. So that's determinant. Whoa. Determinant identity. What is the determinant of the identity? One. It is one. So we get one to the determinant of A. So that's determinant of A. So you can go that way as well. So whichever way you like. So let's think of, there's a reason I proved A. Well, one of them, it was, it was fun, but if we look at A, determinant equals other determinant. Well, if your determinants are equal, how do you get your characteristic polynomial? Determinant of Use the determinant. So if their determinants are the same, characteristic polynomial will be the same. That's a good question. So looking at part C, it seems like with the eigenvalues, your eigenspace, it looks like would be the same dimension. Now, whether it's generated by the same vector, eigenvectors, I'm not sure. We can see if we can prove that, and then if we can prove it, then we'll just write part F right here. Um, so let's see. So if A similar to B, and clearly the um, I shouldn't say clearly. Let's go ahead. Let's let's prove the eigenvectors have to ma eigenvalues have to match, and then we'll go and worry about eigenvectors. Uh, prove so we're prove the eigenvalues are the same. So they come from the equation uh, a x equals lambda x. So we'll subtract lambda uh, and then factor out. And of course, we have to multiply by the identity. So our factoring makes sense. And then we wanted to then set our determinant equal to 0. And that's our p of lambda right there. All right. <coughs> so a is similar to b. That means b equals P inverse AP. That's what it means to be similar. So let's look at BX equals lambda X. And now we'll sub in that ugly P inverse AP. And we'll do that factoring.
All right, so what I'm going to do, I would like this term right here to be multiplied on the left by P inverse and the right by P. So that's what I want it to look like right here. Why am I allowed to commute? Well, first of all, why can I commute lambda? Because it's, it's a scalar. Now, I'm allowed to commute the identity matrix mainly because I can multiply by it whenever I want to and just erase it if I don't want it here because it's multiplying by one. So the identity basically commutes with every matrix you're allowed to multiply with. So, to write this proof in a nice way, what I'm going to do is multiply by P. Actually, let's just go, yeah, I'll multiply by P inverse P. Why am I allowed to multiply by P inverse P? Because it's one, it's the identity. So I'm multiplying by the identity here, which I'm allowed to do. And now I get to commute, so I'm just going to move that uh, P over to the right of the identity. So we got P inverse lambda I P like that. What can I factor out on the left? P inverse. P inverse. And what can I factor out on the right? P. So let's do that. So we got P inverse A. I'll do this in two steps because it's kind of tricky. So that's the first step. We did a left factoring of P inverse. And next up, we'll do a right factoring of regular P. Ooh. So any algebra questions off of those moves we made right there? And of course, what are we trying to do? We're looking for eigenvalues. So I'm going to now, I'll use extra parentheses. So I want to take the determinant of this crazy product right here and set it equal to zero. That's how we'll get our uh, eigenvalues out of this. So we're setting this equal to zero, the determinant equal to zero. Now, if you noticed, well, there was a zero before. What zero is really on the right side over here? We have right here, uh, zero vector. yeah, it's a zero vector. So this is a zero vector. I'm getting kind of lazy about not writing the zero vector and just writing zero. So this is all zero vector on the right side. You don't need to keep writing it if it's not changing. However, these two lines, something major did change on the right side. I went from zero vector to the number zero. So I need to be very careful between these two because the right side definitely changed. Even though if you're an amateur looking, it's like, oh, well, it's all zero, so who cares? But we know the zero means zero vector above, and then that last line, the number zero. All right, so here's our characteristic polynomial. Now I'm going to use the uh, determinant splits across. We're multiplying one, two, three things together. So I'm going to split the determinant across those three pieces, just like we did before. So we got determinant P inverse times determinant A minus lambda I times determinant of P still equals zero. All right, how do I know determinant of P is not zero. It's not given for definition. Why? So determinant P is not going to be zero. Why is that? What if the determinant P was zero? What would that imply? What 
would be wrong over here if the determinant of p was zero? Oh, it's a binary zero. It would be, we, we already know p is invertible, mm -hmm. or else p inverse doesn't exist. So just by definition of similar matrices, that, inver that matrix p is invertible right off the definition. So I know the determinant's not zero. Uh, and of course, now, now I can reorder the multiplication just like I did on that previous proof. So I'll just bring determinant of p over there. And now I can cancel p inverse determinant times p. They're basically reciprocals of each other as numbers. So they'll cancel out. So we just proved is the characteristic polynomial, I'll zoom out a tiny bit, or a little bit more. So in the upper left is the characteristic polynomial of the A matrix. The, the bottom middle of the screen is the characteristic polynomial of the B matrix. And they're exactly the same. Took quite a bit of work to get down there. We had to get creative a little bit, but we got their uh, determinants are or their characteristic polynomials are the same, so their eigenvalues are the same. Now we're going to look at the eigenvectors. So if A is similar to B and lambda is an eigenvalue of both A and B, because we just saw that if you got an eigenvalue of A, it's also an eigenvalue of B. So so it's not a value of both. All right, I'm going to write something that makes an assumption. And I want you to think about what assumption that I just made by writing this. So we know if you have an eigenvalue, you get an eigenvector. You have to compute it. There could be, uh, and of course you can use any scalar multiple of it. Sometimes there are several independent eigenvectors when your eigenspace has multiple dimensions. But what did I just assume by writing those right there? Of course there's an eigenvector. But what did I assume by writing that? Indexes are the same. That the eigenvectors are the same. So I can't assume that the same eigenvector works for both. I just showed, we just showed that the eigenvalue will work for both, but I don't want to assume the eigenvector is the same. So what I'm going to do is give this vector a different name. I think y, y is kind of dangerous. It looks like lambda. So just be careful if you rotate or reflect one of the two, y turns into a lambda. All right, so I want to show now that x is a scalar multiple of y. That's what I want to show. They may not be equal, but they should be, uh, if they're scalar multiples, that's good enough. So now we're going to ask the question, are x and lambda multiples? X and y multiples? Yes, what I wrote, are <laughs> x and y multiples. It's hard to think and talk and write at the same time, so I usually just do one of those. All right, so how in the world are we going to do this? It's tempting to solve for lambda. I think the best we can do, I'm just looking for what's in common between these two equations. The only thing in common is actually lambda. So I could solve for lambda and then basically plug it into the other one. So let's do that. I think that's a reasonable place to start. How would I solve for lambda in the first equation? Can I divide by x? Is there a division? Mm -hmm. Nope, so that's off, that's out. There's no division. X is a scalar, right? Or, um, lambda is a scalar, x would be a vector. So the inverse of x? Well, there's no, that's the other problem. There's no inverse of vectors. So we're really kind of stuck. Identity identity yeah, I think we, the identity will be useful here. Um, 
So here's one thing we can do. We can start by assuming they're not multiples and then possibly get a contradiction. That would be one option. So we could suppose that they are not multiples of each other and then show that that's going to lead to some problem. Maybe do something like subtract them might work. This is tricky. Let's just subtract the equations. Maybe we can do something clever after that. So I'll subtract these two equations. The only thing I can see to do here What can I replace B with? I made one Yeah, I made one assumption at the top that I didn't really use any of the consequence for. So that means uh, P inverse AP equals B. So that property, let's use that right now. If that doesn't give us anything useful here, we can always come back to this part right here and use that property as well. So let's use it down where we are. So we've got AX minus P inverse APY. Not sure what to do next. So why, why would it be illegal to factor A out? So it's basically because multiplication is not commutative. That would, so that would normally work if we had commutativity. I would just bring the A outside. But matrices are quite tricky. All right, so let's draw angry face. So let's start over. So we'll just move to the right a little bit, and get some more space. So let's start with this B Y equals lambda Y. So now I will use that similarity property I think the commutativity might be messing us up because in this case we're no longer taking determinants. Determinant is sort of a kind of a sneaky way to get around commutativity issues. And without taking determinant, I'm not sure how we would show this. So I don't know how to answer your question, unfortunately. Uh, I have a feeling the answer is probably not. They would probably have different vectors. Somewhere I wrote the question. All right, I don't know. It's the shrugging emoji. All right, so that's a good thing to look up. Uh, there's a pretty good chance that if it was true, it would have been part F on that theorem that we just saw. Okay, so let's get back to an example here. This is something we should be able to show. That symbol looks 
too much like a Greek letter. So does that one. We'll just leave it. All right, so what do you think I mean by that symbol? Not similar. Not similar. So all you have to do is check, well, I'll write down A and B. So A is the matrix one, three, two, two. B will be one, one, three, minus one. All right, so to show they're similar, we'd have to create a matrix P such that P inverse AP equals B. But now we're supposed to show that there is no such matrix. We can't try every single matrix and then find the inverse and then multiply them. That would take an infinite amount of time. So that's not reasonable and not even possible. So showing there's no such matrix is going to be tricky. What are some other ideas? Yeah, so let's, let's say that there is a matrix who's invertible that has this property and then derive some contradiction. We also, if we scroll back up, there was that whole properties of similar matrices. So if A and B are similar, all of these are true. If A and B are not similar, all of these are not true. So if we can show one of them's not true, that would be enough to say they're not similar. I think getting eigenvalues might be, as long as they have different eigenvalues, they would not be similar. That'd be one possibility. Let's just go and find their determinants. Maybe we got lucky right there. They got different determinants, we're already done. So that's fast. Let's get determinants and hope they're not equal. So they had the same determinant. So logically what we're doing is a little tricky. So I'm going to give a explanation of uh, just a really fast logic lesson before we uh, go much further. So I'll do it over here on the right side. So we're looking at if A then B. And we can write that down easily. With, uh, the way you write that down in math notation is A double arrow B. So what this means is whenever A is true, B is also true. So what about if A is false? So I'm going to give you a very easy theorem that I think is good for illustrating uh, the way logic works in uh, A implies B. So if I get food poisoning, All right, so if I get food poisoning, then I vomit. All right, I think probably all of us have gotten food poisoning. It's pretty common in the United States, way more common than most other countries. All right, so if I get food poisoning, then I'm gonna vomit. So if you know I ate food, that's going to give me food poisoning for sure. So if I'm going to get food poisoning, you know what's gonna come next. Let's say that you don't know if I got food poisoning or not. You don't know what I ate for breakfast. Maybe, maybe not. Is this theorem helpful if you don't know whether I got food poisoning? Nope. So if you don't know if I got food poisoning, then this theorem is not applicable, not useful in that, in that situation. Uh, what if you scanned every single item of food I was going to eat and you determined there was no way I was going to get food poisoning? You can't really do that, but what if there's some way you can guarantee that I didn't get food poisoning? 
or maybe if I didn't eat food for a week. Can you be assured that I will not vomit? Nope. Maybe I go out drinking because it's New Year's Eve. Didn't eat anything, but I could still have the conclusion. So the only thing a theorem is good for, there's actually two things a theorem is good for. If you know A is true, B has to be true. So that's written right above there. A is true, B has to be true. What if you knew that I didn't vomit for a whole year? What could you conclude? I couldn't have had food poisoning. Because if I did, you would not have observed vomit for a year. So that is what we call the contrapositive. It's logically equivalent. So contrapositive is not B implies not A. Actually, I'm going to use computer science notation, which is exclamation point. Have any of you done any coding before? A few of you a little bit? All right. So the exclamation point means not. Does not mean factorial, which you'll see soon in calculus class. Factorial would actually go on the other side. Uh, so in this case, exclamation point means not. All right, it's a little bit strange, but if you reverse the order and negate both sides, it's equivalent. For the exact reason that I said, if you don't, if you did observe that the conclusion was not happening, then you could conclude that the hypothesis didn't happen. Because if it did happen, you would guaranteed see the conclusion. All right, so why am I telling you about food poisoning and vomiting? Because I want you to not forget the way logic works. So we're going to come back to the math world right here. What we just showed is A is not happening. No, we didn't. No, we showed A is happening. So this theorem is written in a slightly weird way. So here we have, if A is similar to B, then all these conditions are true. What we just showed is determinant of A equals determinant of B. That does not imply that A is similar to B. So if we go back to this theorem, what we just observed is this happening. However, that doesn't mean that I got food poisoning. Does that make sense? We observed the conclusion does not mean it came from that particular hypothesis. Something else could have caused it. So unfortunately, we need to do more work. All right, so if we could show that one of these is not happening, then we can say they're not similar. So that's what we're trying to do, show that one of these is not happening. So let's get the... Let's go for, I, well, we already saw the term is, they're both invertible, so we're not going to uh, violate B. So let's go and see, uh, I think their ranks will probably be the same. Let's go and compute their eigenvalues. That'll probably be the next easiest thing to do. All right, let's have a race. I'll give you a 30 second head start for finding the eigenvalues. You gotta find, there could be two eigenvalues of each matrix, up to two.
So we got different eigenvalues. Any questions on eigenvalues? I thought the work on your paper looked a little too easy. Yeah. All right, make sure when you're doing your eigenvalues, I see a lot of you are kind of ignoring that minus six. So it's a minus six, not multiply by six. So make sure you're careful. It kind of rearranges your, uh, just be careful when you compute it. And if you haven't done enough eigenvalue computations, do some more. All right, so what we showed is not number, not number E. So E didn't work. So what that means is our hypothesis not happening. So that's what we just showed. So different eigenvalues imply A is not similar to B. So now ready for the definition of diagonalizable. So we have to have a square matrix. is diagonalizable if there is a diagonal matrix so I don't think I've used the word diagonal matrix before maybe I have a while ago but it's a matrix that's both upper and lower triangle matrix so it's got zeros in the lower triangle lower left and zeros in the upper right triangle so the only place that has not zero is on the diagonal. That's why it's called a diagonal matrix. So the identity is a diagonal matrix, but a diagonal matrix doesn't have to have ones down the diagonal. It can have any numbers down the diagonal. So we'll use capital D for the diagonal matrix. And we'll use D1, D2, Dn. Those will be the diagonal they could be zero, but they don't have to be. If there's a diagonal matrix D such that uh, A is similar to the diagonal matrix D. So right, we have enough time to write down our next theorem. Uh, I do want to prove it if it's possible because our proofs are fun now. I don't know why you laugh, they're very fun. Theorem. A is square matrix, so matrix n by n. A is diagonalizable if and only if A has N linearly independent eigenvectors. So the if and only if, that is different than uh, if then. So this is a both uh, bi-directional correspondence. 
So that means if A is diagonalizable, then A has N linearly independent eigenvectors. It also means that if A has N linearly independent eigenvectors, then A is diagonalizable. So it goes both directions. So that means if one of them is true, they're both true. If one is false, they're both false. So it's the exact same thing on both sides. So we'll wait till tomorrow to get into this proof.